So we're going to begin talking about the Holocaust, which is a very, very heavy subject. And every year it is especially hard on me. It's really, really hard emotionally. Because on the bright side, you only have to listen to this one time. I have to do this five times. And by the end, I just feel just bleh. I don't really want to do anything. And so a few years ago, I was thinking about it like, you know, this is so hard every single time emotionally. And I was thinking, you know, you guys probably know a lot about this already. You learned about it in eighth grade. You're going to learn about it again. Yeah, I know you read, you guys read Mouse with Baron, and so I got into this mindset of, and I very seriously considered cutting the Holocaust from the curriculum because of those reasons, that you know it already. And it's just, it's hard on me emotionally. And so I was about to make that decision when I saw this online. There were over 40,000 camps and ghettos during the Holocaust, and 49% of millennials cannot name one. One. Half of my generation can't name a single concentration camp. And it's not just them. One third, one third of Americans and more than 40% of millennials believe that substantially less, less than 6 million Jews were killed during the Holocaust. 45% of Americans can't name a single concentration camp. And when I read that, it filled me with such anger and disappointment this is a fundamental failure in our educational system. That half of my generation doesn't even know basic facts about this. And so with that in mind, that really cemented my conviction that no, I'm not cutting this. This is too important to cut. I do not want you to be in that statistic. As God is my witness, you will be able to answer these questions when years from now you're asked. And so that is why I, I am very, very earnest on this topic in particular, because it is so important, and yet half of the country doesn't even know about it, or do, knows some things, but you know, fundamental flaws with their, with their understanding of it. Uh, I'm sorry I was yelling. I was just angry at people in general, not at you. <laughs> but like all historical events, we need to set up some context. We can't just jump in to the topic. Did Hitler wake up one morning and say, I'm going to kill the Jews? No. There were steps that were followed. There was a process. There were a series of ideas. Hitler didn't come up with these ideas on his own. The Nazis didn't come up with these ideas on his own, on their own, I should say. And so we need to set up some context. And hence why we will begin with this idea of eugenics. Even, even eugenics needs some context. Isn't that fun? Everything needs context. So in the 1850s, 1840s, there was a British man. He decided to go on a vacation of sorts. He got on, on board the HMS Beagle, and he set sail from England to the Galapagos Islands. And while he was on the Galapagos Islands, he observed all sorts of different animals, particularly finches. And he noticed that some of these finches had you know, different, different sized beaks and different lengths. And wow. Would you, would, who would guess that uh, you know, the beaks of these birds in these particular areas, they were just perfectly fit for the, the types of food that they eat? Who am I talking about? Charles Darwin. Darwin. Charles Darwin. Mr. Gay, I thought this was a history class, not bio. Shut up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope the sarcasm is, is conveyed on the recording. <laughs> 
are just berating the same student over and over. <laughs> so Darwin had his idea of Darwinism, evolution. What's kind of the idea, the main idea of evolution? Survival of the fittest. Specifically, through the mechanism of natural selection. So for instance, um, and this applies to every living thing, according to Darwin. So does this apply to bacteria? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does it apply to trees? Yes. And, and horses? Yes. And coyotes? Mm -hmm. And on and on and on, down the line. Anything that has genetic information, this applies to. So let's say, let's imagine a tree, one of these ponderosa trees, they start growing, but they don't have any bark. How are they going to do? Oh, they're probably going to die. They're probably, are they going to be able to pass on that genetic marker? No. no. That mutation was not fit for survival, so natural selection weeds it up. Same thing, let's imagine a lion is growing up and the lion cannot grow teeth. How's that lion going to do? Not very, not very well. And we can just go down the line. So, some people took this idea and, and ran with it. Um, and some people started thinking, well, if you think about it, aren't people animals too? I mean, technically speaking, if we don't get into like a philosophical discussion about you know, where's the line between humans and animals, uh, you know, we sexually reproduce, we pass on genes, there's a set from the mom, set from the dad, creates a new person. Those genes are subject to mutation and to change. So, I mean, strictly speaking, scientifically speaking, all we are are animals, right? So people start applying this to society. So what, do we, what is that called when we call, apply Darwinism <coughs> to society? Isn't this like, oh wait, never mind. Okay. Yeah. Social Darwinism. Social Darwinism. Some people start to believe that some groups of people are better than others, biologically. And they claim that their, their form of racism is scientific. Clearly, white people, according to this idea, are better than the quote-unquote Orientals, or better than the, the Africans, or better than all these other groups. And before I continue, I just want to make it clear I am not attempting to express my own opinion. I am expressing the opinions of these people, okay? I am going, uh, it's called being a devil's advocate. And this lecture in particular, I, I'm gonna come really close to the devil. This, it may, this lecture honestly makes me really uncomfortable personally, expressing these ideas, but I want you to understand that these are not my ideas, I'm just the vessel for them, if that makes sense, okay? I can imagine someone going, oh, Mr. J said that. No, oh, no, that's not what I meant. Okay. So, we have this idea of social Darwinism. Now, let's rewind just a little bit. Human beings are an interesting group. We have many uh, unique qualities. Among them, human beings have been able, over the course of 10,000 years or so, to manipulate other life forms to breed them together in certain ways that benefit us. Say again? Bananas. Dogs. <laughs> bananas. I don't know how to spell bananas. Okay. <laughs> it is, it's great. What other life forms have human beings manipulated for our benefit? Cats. Cats, kind of, but sure. Horses. Horses. Whales. That's super vague. Hamsters. Hamsters. What, what kind of plants? We got bananas. Vegetables. That's super vague. <laughs> oh, tomatoes. 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 Carrots. Kiwi. Carrots. <laughs> Kiwis. Apples. Apples. Oh, we're really focused on plants right now. Corn. <laughs> Did you know wild corn is like that big? And we've been able to manipulate it through breeding to be this big! Ah, America! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! 
Bamboo. All right, what else? Bamboo. Bamboo. Wait, so like sure. baby carrots? Are, we like are like the real white baby carrots? No. No, so no, like just, baby just corn. corn. Just corn. That's what I meant. Baby corn? I think so. Is like the way it's supposed to be? I think so. I, uh, there's not a lot of actual yeah. wild so corn like anymore. Baby. Yeah. I haven't really like, manipulated things to make like vaccines and that kind of thing. That's true, too. We've even manipulated bacteria yeah. and various viruses. I didn't think about that, but that's true. What about like cows and pigs? Cows, pigs, chickens. Basically, just go to the grocery store. <laughs> chickens, did you know wild chickens are really tiny and they don't have a lot of meat on them? They're scrawny. Yeah. But now we've taken chickens and they're huge! <laughs> and they live in a cage forever and they don't have any room. America. That's progress, America! <laughs> Oh, pineapples? Did you know there are no actual, like, native pineapples anymore? They're all genetically modified. What's that? I thought you were going to say, like, that, that, like, originally, like, there is no pineapple. Like, we created it. No, 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 no. <laughs> I was like, do not tell me. No, that. no. I'm saying that all the pineapples have been genetically modified. It's so if you go to the store and something says non-GMO, you're like, nope, it still is. If it's a pineapple, <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> I, I learned that from a vegan dance instructor. I did not want to learn that, but I did. <laughs> he told me all about it. <laughs> Can I just put it, et cetera? Yeah. <laughs> lots and lots of different things. Now, I want to focus on one particular life form, my personal favorite, bamboo. Dogs. Bamboo. <laughs> <laughs> my personal favorite life form, bamboo. <laughs> dogs. So there's all sorts of different breeds of dogs. Give me some examples of a breed and why it was bred. Yeah. The Chihuahua. Good for kicking. It You're right. right. <laughs> it is a manifestation if, of God's hate. If it doesn't come up to your knee, it's not a dog. You can drop it yeah. over. Oh, yeah. Hugs are like modified beyond belief. Hugs are also good for kicking. It's good. Okay. Yes. Huskies for sled. Good. We got an actual dog now. Huskies, good for sled dogs. Also, they are, you know, they got good winter coats. Go. German Shepherd is good for sniffing things out and obeying commands. And they're very loyal, and they're pretty, they could be pretty mean, Jeez. very good dog, very good guard dogs. Greyhounds. Oh, Greyhounds, what are they for? Racing. Racing, hunting, they can run really, really fast. Yeah. Labradors for retrieving. Labradors for retrieving, they've got softer teeth than other dogs, and they've got webbed toes. Not too bright, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Labradoodles for looking cute. Okay. <laughs> If you want to take that, sure. <laughs> that affront to God that you have just presented to me. Wiener <laughs> dogs for hot dogs, of course. <laughs> they are actually bred for badger hunting, so wiener dogs are okay. They're, they count as a dog. Also, we got for the queen. All right, all right. we've got border collies are good for herding. Australian shepherds, same thing. Border collies are the smartest dog, so good for them. Uh, they're my personal favorite dog. Um, there's my dog, who's oh, wow. not very smart at all. Yeah, um, good she's good for uh, freaking out when the neighbors walk by. <laughs> and alert. You know, it's funny, the, the burly refrigerator repairman, she's fine with them, but a kindly old woman, oh my god, no! <laughs> Strange. Anyway, so, we have all of these different life forms that we have manipulated in some way or other. Then the question is, if we can do this to dogs and cats and horses and chickens, what else could we do this to? People. Theoretically, could we? If human beings are just animals. And that is the idea of eugenics. By definition, this is a lengthy definition, so you can just kind of you know, hit the highlights, but I think it's worthwhile looking at anyhow. Eugenics is the science of improving a human population by controlled breeding to increase the occurrence of desirable, heritable characteristics developed largely by Sir Francis Galton as a method of improving the human race. So in the same way that we breed horses, we have thoroughbred horses, let's apply that to people as well. 
I've got a list of people up here. Can we see this text? It was a bit small and burnt out. Are there any names that we recognize on this list? Oh, Helen Keller. Helen Keller. Who's Helen Keller? She's the blind and deaf woman. Yeah, but she learned how to, how to communicate. She learned sign language and eventually became a great intellectual and wrote books. Um, any others that we recognize? Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill. Who's that? He led, uh, yeah. I, he led, he led England. Yeah, so he's the England. Sorry, he's the leader of England during World War II. Very influential man, very funny man too. Yeah, did you have one? Well, I said today really cool, but also, I I feel like we all know the name Jacques Cousteau, but like. Right too. What? No. <laughs> he was the Spanish explorer. Okay. No, French. There we go. So Jacques Cousteau was a was a, a marine biologist. He would go down in in submarines and look at fish. And made he was very famous for this. He made documentaries and things like that. How about H.G. Wells? Anyone know him? He is an author, sci-fi, early early sci-fi. So he, he wrote uh, War of the Worlds and The Time Machine and The Invisible Man as well. He wrote that. Aldous Huxley, anyone know that name? Aldous Huxley wrote uh, Brave New World, which is a great book. I highly recommend it. It's about in 700 years in the future, babies are no longer born. They're grown in jars. And it's about this whole new totalitarian society. Uh, eight, a Brave New World and 1984 make a very good comparison in terms of a totalitarian future. Highly recommend. Bit of a downer ending, though. Um, Bertrand Russell was an atheist philosopher. George Bernard Shaw was also a philosopher. Teddy Roosevelt, of course, was a US president. Margaret Sanger, anyone recognize that name? Yeah. yeah so you know? Yes, but I can't even tell if she's like That's fine. an artist or a politician. Like Neither. <laughs> she's the founder of Planned Parenthood. Oh, I mean, I, I didn't that. know who she was. Now, obviously these are all people, but they also have something else in common with each other, besides the fact that they are all people. Oh. Okay, yeah. You're right, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add another name. Okay, Adolf Hitler. Let's add him to this list. What do they all have in common? They all believe in eugenics. Say again. They all believe in eugenics. They all believe in eugenics to some extent. Some more so than others. But everyone on this list at some point in time, expressed a view towards we should probably breed people in order to improve humanity. This was an international movement, predominantly led by Americans. Only healthy seed must be sown. Check the seeds of hereditary disease and unfitness by eugenics. That poster was made in America. I would have to double check. But we should keep in mind, eugenics in the 19 teens and 1920s was considered the cutting edge of scientific discovery. It wasn't something to be argued against. It was just a fact, according to them. It was just something that, yeah, this is obviously what we need to do. So they were hoping to get rid of hereditary disease through breeding. So hereditary disease, that's a disease that is passed down from parent to child in the genetics. So it's not like a cold that I have right now and I'm still recovering from. It's something in the genes. Can we think of any examples of a hereditary disease? Cancer. 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 Some, some forms of cancer have a genetic component. What else? Yeah. Cow. Cow? OK, I don't know how to spell that. G-O-U-T. That is like a group. What else? Not really. All right. Forms of heart disease that you can Various heart diseases. All right, stop that. <coughs> heart diseases. <coughs> Diabetes has a genetic component to it. <gasps> Albinism? Say again. Albinism? Oh, yeah, so albinos. Uh, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. Uh, 
Parkinson's? Uh, hemophilia? Hemophilia, that's where you bleed and you can't clot. The opposite is where you can't stop clotting. My wife has that. It's called factor five. And it's called by other things as well. She has a genetic issue there. Hemophilia, factor five. Schizophrenia? Wait, so is that like uh, one where you clot too much? Like it can give you like a stroke or a heart attack if you get cut? Yeah. So you have to have like blood thinning? Yeah, my, my wife has to take blood thinners all the time. Schizophrenia has a genetic component. One of my uncles was diagnosed schizophrenic, so if I have a bad day, it could happen to me. You're fine, though. It's on my dad's side. Um, just got cancer on my mom's side. Hemophilia, <laughs> factor five, schizophrenia, depression. What? Like hardcore depression, like it's like deals with brain chemistry. Is an addictive like personality? Addictions can be a, a genetic. Bipolar disorder, um, autism, Down syndrome. Can I just put etc.? Unless we got any really good ones. So I mean, just look at this list. This is a short list of diseases that are in our society. All because of genetics. Wouldn't it be better if we didn't have these diseases in society? Yeah. Certainly. I mean, think about how much suffering is caused by all of these things every single year. Alzheimer's, you know, your grandparents losing their memories and losing their minds. Depression, horrible addictions. My wife, she had a blood clot that started at the top of her hip and went all the way down her entire leg, all because of her genetic disorder. It almost killed her. And that was probably the scariest. We had to go to the hospital. We were in the hospital for like a week, a week straight. And she almost died. And it was the scare, probably the scariest time in my entire life. Wouldn't it be better if we didn't, and then all the money, too, that we spend on all of these every single year. Wouldn't it be better if we got rid of these things? Yeah. It would. The eugenicists say we can do that by selective breeding. By breeding out, getting rid of the dysgenic, quote unquote. So for instance, if you're taking care of a tree and one of the branches is sick, what are you gonna do to that branch? Cut it off. So they were hoping to breed out of existence dysgenic people. So that could include people with hereditary diseases. It often included the mentally and the physically handicapped. I don't recall. I think the king. Yeah, because there's a movie about that. Yeah, the king did. Mentally and physically handicapped, the poor, and the undereducated. Wow, the poor. How can you? Well, think about it. If if a poor family has twelve kids, are they going to be likely to take care of their kids well? Not very well. So either give them birth control and prevent them from breeding, or maybe even, well, we'll get to that in a moment, but prevent them from breeding in order so that way they can't, don't have to suffer in that way. And then often, of course, the eugenicists would put anyone that is non-white as a dysgenic person. That's what they said. That's actually why Margaret Sanger set up Planned Parenthood. That was her express purpose, was to give birth control to the poor and the uneducated and the non-white to make sure that they don't breed. Eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. 
Like a tree, eugenics draws its materials from many sources and organizes them into a harmonious society. And I really have to emphasize that this was cutting edge science of the time. And it became so popular that it started working into the medical profession. Doctors started making recommendations based on these ideas and it got into the law as well. We'll get to that in a moment. Any questions on this before I continue? So this is a medical chart that doctors used in the 1920s to help identify mental handicap. So we have different levels, idiot, medium imbecile, low grade imbecile, high grade imbecile, moron. So if you've ever called your friends idiots or morons or imbeciles, you are using jargon that was used to describe mental handicapped people in the 1920s. So they set up, Margaret Sanger, for instance, set up Planned Parenthood to give condoms and birth control to people to, to prevent them from breeding. Some people went further, and they set up sterilization laws. Compulsory sterilization. What's sterilization? Can't have it, it, it prevents you from having children ever again. So there were laws on the books in Arizona. There was a law on the book. If a court decided that you were a dysgenic person, if you were mentally or physically handicapped, the, the government could force you to be sterilized against your will. So for women, they would tie the tubes, do a surgery and tie the tubes. For men, it would be a vasectomy. Eventually, that turned into chemical castration. So they would give you chemicals, and then they would kill your testes. Throughout the United States, 60,000 people were sterilized against their will. In Arizona, thousands of people were also sterilized against their will. Question, is this constitution? No. Why? Do you have the right to your own mental and physical health? Do you? Well, in the constitution, does it protect your Plus, do you have a right to have children? No. Well, don't you have a right to pursue your happiness ah. depending on how you So, in order to pursue your own happiness, <coughs> you will selfishly cause a child to suffer with cerebral palsy. Well, it depends on, like, I don't know. This went up to the, to the Supreme Court. This was challenged in the court. It was called Buck versus Bell. And in Buck versus Bell, the Supreme Court decided eight to one, eight to one, that compulsory sterilization was constitutional. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, he wrote the majority opinion, he had this to say. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. In Arizona, they kept that law on the books until 1956. Some states kept them until the 70s. One thing that's interesting, though, is that this decision has never been overturned. People just stopped having the laws. So that means, theoretically, if Arizona passed a sterilization law tomorrow, it would be considered constitutional. Of course, it would probably be immediately challenged, and hopefully it would be sh shut down. But according to this, it is still considered constitutional. Some people are born to be a burden on the rest. One man in particular took these ideas very, very seriously. His name was Dr. Hazelton. He was an obstetrician. He delivered babies. And he took it upon himself to decide whether or not a certain baby was allowed to live or was fit enough to live. And he actually made his own movie. physician, his profession in real life as well, Dr. Harry Hazelton, and a deformed baby.
Dr. Hazelton spreads the gospel of eugenics in his own way. By refusing... I'm sorry, we're running short on time. The point is, he let children die. He refused to give them medical help if he determined them to be dysgenic. He was arrested for infanticide. One second. He was arrested for infanticide. He stood trial, and the jury acquitted him because they agreed with him that certain babies should not be allowed to live. And that leads to your cool-down question, how might this idea connect to the Holocaust?